Good afternoon. My name is Molly Hall, and I am the Gallery Director at Meredith College. Thank you for joining us this afternoon over Zoom. The Mercer Kessler Lecture Series invites scholars in the areas of visual arts, architecture, and religion to speak at Meredith on their respective fields. I would like to introduce the Mercer Kessler Lecturer and Artist for this year, Alyssa Hinton who is a mixed media artist from Burlington, North Carolina. Her exhibition, entitled Spiritual Awakening, Native Roots and Culture, is currently on view and open to the public in Weems Gallery until October 19th. Alyssa calls her body of work the art of transformation because it refers to the process of reawakening her Southeastern Native American culture. Her lecture, will not only include some of her artwork currently on view in the Williams Gallery, but it touches upon her insight to spiritual experiences and their influences. Her lecture will be accompanied by Charlie and the Sunshine. Lead singer Charlie Lowry is an award-winning singer-songwriter from Pembroke, North Carolina, with roots in the Union Chapel community. Charlie is an activist for Lumbee and Native American rights. Lowry immerses herself in the culture of American music and expands her listening ear to various genres, all the while composing songs that give a personal account of her experience as an indigenous woman walking in two worlds. I hope that you enjoy this lecture and performance. The Q&A will remain open throughout the webinar and at the end, Alyssa will take the remaining questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us in cyberspace. It's great to be here at Meredith College with such an amazing um, venue and gallery. And I'm really happy that I have Charlie and the Sunshine Band here with me. Um, to get started, I'm going to talk about my life as a spiritually guided artist. As a spiritually guided artist, I want to start by sharing some thoughts with you on what I believe to be the spiritual role of art and artists in society. Wassily Kandinsky was a Russian expressionist painter and Bauhaus professor in pre-Hitler Germany. He also led an artist group called Blue Rider who followed his stated ideal that art is the embodiment of the spirit no matter what form it might assume. In the same way that art can embody spirit, artists throughout history have realized the role of healer, philosopher, mystic, and shaman by way of expressing spiritual truths to others through their art. In her article, The Artist as Enchanter, Susie Gablick, a New York artist and critic, referred to our culture's denial of mythic vision as the sickness of our time. She points out that we are losing our sense of the divine side of life, the power of imagination, myth, dream, and vision. We worship rationalism. It's the artist who relies on intuition in our culture. It's the artist who delves into subconscious realms on a regular basis, providing cathartic experiences for themselves and others. In the midst of our daily humdrum, the artist is a metaphysical excuse me, a metaphysical conduit for others. Whereas logic and deduction have been elevated over symbolism in mainstream society, life within traditional Indian culture leans towards mystical and philosophical forms of knowing. In his book, Lame Deer, Seeker of Visions, Lakota holy man, John Fire Lame Deer explains that traditional Indians live in a world of symbols and images where the spiritual and commonplace are one. 
Before I share my art, I'd like to talk about my mixed background. My mother was mostly African and Native American, and my father was mostly English. When I was small, I experienced some pretty harsh racism at the hands of teachers and neighbors, which made me really want to explore all the parts of my heritage. It was the Indian part that was the most submerged. It was like a painful hidden legacy that was kept out of sight over generations as a type of survival strategy. From the time I was a teenager, I was obsessed with digging up this buried history. It started with an old box of photos that my grandparents gave to my mother, along with some seeds of information. Grandmom's grandmom was Osage Indian and granddad's folks were from tri-racial isolate communities and plantations in eastern North Carolina. Pretty soon after that, my mother asked me to make a family tree drawing from the photos. And that was the one on the right here, that's the family tree drawing. In art school, I branched out and explored many themes under many professors, but I eventually returned to my Indian identity to North Carolina, and to the history and culture of the Southeast. Dreams and visions played a huge role in this homecoming. In fact, I received a vision of a burial mound with a tree in broad daylight with 20 students in my classroom at George School, a Quaker boarding school where I taught art. This happened after I had started to make collages out of images that I had copied from the Xerox machine in the basement that I also used to copy handouts for my students. I wasn't sure what the vision meant, but I knew it was important and needed to go straight into my work. And now at this juncture, I'm gonna have Charlie and Sunshine play a couple of songs for you.
everyone for tuning in. This next song is in honor of our missing and murdered indigenous women. It's a song called Keep My Memory. My power, my 
Not long after I had the vision, I joined a Native women's singing circle in Philadelphia where I met singer-songwriter Puda Fey. Little did I know she was actually a long-lost relative whose grandparents were Tuscarora from Johnston County, North Carolina. This meant that my grandfather, who had died that year, would have been Tuscarora as well. We figured out we were related based on the names that were on the deed my grandfather had left for some plantation property that he owned. In fact, I traveled south with Purifé and another cousin to look up records in the Smithfield courthouse and found an Indian ancestor's name on a will. She was being willed over to another plantation along with furniture, mule carts, and other utilitarian possessions. You can see that her name circled in red here in this picture. I also located the plantation property that I had inherited from my grandfather. It was surrounded by tobacco and cotton crops. This experience was the inspiration for the Mums the Word collage that you see on the right. This piece is in my show. Starting that piece helped me digest the bitter reality of enslaved Indian ancestors. After that, the floodgates opened up and my art started pouring out like Niagara Falls. I was learning about the significance of the burial mounds from Puda Fe and created a series of paper collages of my original vision of the tree on a mound. During this period, I spent hundreds of hours of creative isolation in my studio. This piece is called Homeward and shows ducks flying south being pulled like magnets towards home. By 1997, Purifé and I had both moved to the Triangle from Philadelphia to be quote unquote on location and tap into the river that is the history and culture of, of our ancestors. We were involved in many community gatherings, youth groups, ceremonies, and singing groups headed by Purifé. It was like an Indian Renaissance with a lot of dress sewing going on as well. I felt a profound sense of belonging during this time. Back in my studio in Carborough, North Carolina, I was making all kinds of amazing connections. I realized the mound was like a womb. And then from that arch shape, a turtle began to take form organically. Then I learned that the turtle is a female icon correlating to the element of water and to birth and regeneration. The piece on the left is based on another vision I had of a blue flame halfway up the trunk of a tree. Not long after I placed the tree on the turtle's back, I saw an Iroquois emblem on a pamphlet of a turtle with a tree on its back. The piece on the right shows the iconic photo of Chief Bigfoot in death at the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890, an event that marked the end of the last free Indians in North America. The way I combined the symbols here talks about the rebirth of Indian culture because I'm resurrecting Chief Bigfoot through a water element, the turtle. The concept progresses in the piece on the right called Triune. where I brought out the three sacred fires that you can see in the first piece. According to a book of Cherokee wisdom teachings by Yanni Yawahu, the blue flame is the first sacred fire, which stands for purpose. The red flame stands for compassion, and the yellow one stands for skill. These are the ingredients of great accomplishment. Now for this last part of my lecture, I'd like to share two prophecies that have influenced my work. The prophecy of the seventh generation and the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. The seventh generation prophecy could be described as a strategic plan founded upon earth consciousness. It says we should always project forward seven generations in decision-making when it comes to water, air, and earth. 
According to this prophecy, native youth of the day and of this day and age are the seventh generation living under colonization and will find ways to regenerate their culture. In this piece, a child's face is shown as the centerpiece for a burial mound with a tree, denoting the reawakening of the seventh generation. In 2016, 60 tribes united, along with many non-Indians, to protest the transport of fracked oil by pipeline across Indian burial grounds and beneath the Missouri River. They called themselves the Water Protectors, and they were fulfilling the prophecy in a very conscious way. The prophecy of the eagle and the condor originated in Peru and speaks of the coming together of the Indian world in terms of North and South America, but also symbolizes the integration of the mind with the heart. John Perkins, author of the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman, offers the following breakdown. The prophecy of the eagle and the condor probably began more than 2,000 years ago. It says, back in the midst of human history, human societies took two routes. The eagle peoples flew the path of the mind of science, technology, and industry. The condor peoples flew the path of the heart, of passion, intuition, and spiritual connections with nature. It goes on to explain that for centuries, the eagle and the condor would never meet. Then in the fourth Kakakuti, which, me which means a 500 year interval in the Quechua language in Peru, which began in about 1500 AD, their paths would cross. History confirms the first prophecy starting with the arrival of Columbus in 1492, as illustrated in this glorified painting by John Vanderlyn. As the eagle swept into Condor territory, the indigenous people were nearly annihilated. But the prophecy says that 500 years later, at the beginning of the fifth Pakakuti, the opportunity arises for the eagle and the condor to fly together and produce a most remarkable offspring, the melding of the heart and the mind. The beginning of the fifth Pakakuti was a time of serious awakening and networking among indigenous nations. These interactions led to international forums with a strong native presence in the United Nations. In January 1992, Iroquois clan mother Audrey Shenandoah spoke at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. There she offered an earth restoration strategy which included principles for environmental restoration and sustainable development. She suggested that these traditional strategies are a model for the future survival of humanity across the entire globe. And now we're going to break once again and have Charlie in the Sunshine play a couple more songs for you. I have seen what man can do when the evil lives inside of you and many are the weak and the strong of you where the water will start anew so won't you take me down to the river take me down to the stream take me down to the water we're gonna wash our souls clean take me down to the levee Take me down to the stream. Yes, we'll all go together. We're going to do it for the good Lord's sake. Yeah. I have fallen so many times for the devil's sweet cunning rise. This whole world has brought me pain, but there's hope for me again yes there is now so won't you take me down to the river take me down to the stream take me down to the water we're gonna wash our souls clean take me down to the
the levee, take me down to the stream. Yes, we'll all go together. We're gonna do it for the good Lord's sake. I tried my hand at the Bible, tried my hand at prayer, but now nothing but the water is gonna bring my soul to bear. But now nothing but the water. He's going to bring my soul to bed. In the end, whatever happens to plants and animals, it happened to us humans. This piece called Turtle Veve Fortune 500 is one of many earth cries that I created over my entire art career. It's a warning about the disappearance of plant and animal species and the rapid ecological degradation plaguing the earth. Around the same time that I created this piece, 
I had a waking dream of a large white bird of prey with outstretched wings. The entire body was made of circuit board patterns instead of feathers. This is a digital collage sketch of that experience. In 2017, I spotted some boards on the street and the eagle and condor sculpture was born. This is the 13th and final sculpture from the Ancestral Spaceship series, which is in my show here at Meredith. It uses circuit board imagery and actual circuit board parts, as well as copper coils from my old computer to express a continued cultural identification in a digital era. This slide shows the finished base with added found wood and furniture parts. And I actually brought it here today. And so I'd like to, act to show it to you. With COVID-19, the earth is sending us a strong message that we need to make a radical shift in the way that we live. Business as usual is not sustainable. I've had this scrap of yellow paper in my studio since the 90s. It's the corner of an old uh, file folder. Hurricanes, floods, mass extinction, fires and diseases are telling us to re-examine who we are as individuals and as a species. Medical science has some answers, but vaccines are not enough. And there's no going back to normal. There's only going forward. Listening to the message of the web of life will bring us the other answers. The eagle and the condor sculpture represents the future survival of humanity on Earth through environmental stewardship. This can be achieved by bringing the head and the heart together in order to rise to the challenge of environmental sustainability. By rising to the fulfillment of our own true nature, higher consciousness. And now I'm going to have Charlie in the sunshine play a couple more songs and that will bring to an end my presentation. And there will be a question and answer period after that. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Colorful, deep rooted in originality. I candy of shallow minds. That was her reality. Still, she walks around with a smile. 
for the whole wide world to see. Inside to scream and free yourself from strains of society. Brown skin, why do you hide the pain within? Brown skin, brown skin. Day in, day out, it's the same. Living by the standards of a male domain. She can't help but recognize the stairs because of who she's talking to, or the clothes she wears. Yeah. She holds her head up high for the whole wide world to see. Inside to scream and free herself from strains of society. Brown skin, why do you hide the pain with me? Brown skin, brown skin, brown skin, why do you hide the pain with me? Brown skin. How long will you continue to pretend that who you know where you go on face the life you leave? That what you do where you be will catch up with you in the end. Yes. Live your own life, don't worry about the need to please. Be the queen of your own society.
Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this lecture and presentation. Uh, this ends the lecture part of this webinar. And now we are able to take any questions that you all may have. Um, we have two already lined up for us. The first question comes from Lisa Pierce. She would like to know if you and Charlie have ever had a collaborative relationship in terms of Alyssa taking the words from Charlie's songs and putting them into your artwork? That's a really good question. No, I have not, but I'm sure that would work out quite well. It's something that I used to do a lot with Pruda Fay, and Pruda Fay is also a mentor of Charlie, as far as I know. <laughs> so we have that in common, and we've, we've been involved in um, the same community activities throughout the years on a number of occasions. Usually the, the common thing was Pruda Fay being there or, or somehow uh, community based in that way. Can you speak a little more about the relationship between you and Charlie? Well, um, back during those days that I described in my presentation when we had a lot of um, community events and various youth groups and cultural activities. Um, I ran into Charlie a lot because she was often performing in the community at different fundraisers and um, singing on stage with kind of different groupings of women or with her different bands. So I just sort of bumped into her over the years. Even in Durham, I think she was performing up in Durham at the farmer's market once. Um, can you talk a little bit about your exhibition currently on view at Weems Gallery? For example, are your artworks for sale? Um, and are there albums for purchase for Charlie and the Sunshine? Uh, most of the artworks in my exhibit are for sale. There are a couple that are not, but overall, yes, they're for sale. They, they vary in price range because some of them are unique, one of a kind. Some of them are very large, unique, one of a kind, and then others are prints. So they, they vary in cost. Um, Charlie has several Dark Water Rising albums, which was one of her, the variations of her um, band over the years. But Charlie and the Sunshine. Is Charlie and the Sunshine, I believe, is a fairly new iteration. Yes. So maybe she's probably going to be putting out an album soon, I would guess. So stay tuned if you're interested in buying an album for Charlie and the Sunshine. Um, we can wait a little bit longer if any other questions arise. But as of right now, it looks like we are coming to an end of this Zoom webinar. Thank you, Alyssa 
for your wonderful lecture and thank you to Charlie and the Sunshine for your incredible performance. It was a truly moving presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>